हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वाचिंग वॉचिंग विद मी पलकी शर्मा The India Canada row remains a top focus. Justin Trudeau has chosen war and offered no proof of the charges that he's made against India. Now he's trying to rally support from his western allies who've all issued statements but refused to sour their relationship with India to serve Trudeau's purpose. Meanwhile, the Canadian press and some leaders in his own party are hauling Trudeau over the coals for supporting Khalistanis. We'll tell you how his plan is backfiring and how the West will pay the price for its terror hypocrisy, like it has done in the past. It disregards India's warnings and concerns and suffers the consequences. Also, will this diplomatic war impact trade ties between India and Canada? Who stands to lose more? We'll discuss all of that. In other news, S.J. Shankar is back from Pakistan. He started the day with a morning walk and wrapped up with some straight talk at the SCO. A report on the multi-bomb threats and how they have caused panic among Indian airlines, why the US has threatened to stop military aid to Israel, episode two of the Netanyahu Macron war of words, how billionaires are funding Donald Trump's election campaign and how it compares to that of Kamala Harris, why trust in the media is eroding and who is to blame for it, and companies do not want to hire Gen Z because they're too entitled and easily offended. We'll examine the findings of a new survey, the headlines first. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky unveils his long-awaited victory plan, rejecting any territorial concessions to Russia, calling for more support from the West, including an invitation to join NATO. The Kremlin says Zelensky's plan is futile. Russia has seized around a fifth of Ukraine's territory since its invasion in 2022. Will China review Intel products sold in the country? A Chinese Cybersecurity Association recommends it, says Intel products threaten China's national interests. Semiconductor giant Intel is based in California. For months now, China and the U.S. have been locked in a tit-for-tat tech battle. A fuel tanker explosion in northern Nigeria kills more than 100 people. Dozens more were, were injured. Many of the victims were trying to collect the fuel which spilled on the road. Nigeria is battling its worst economic crisis in years, making fuel a precious commodity in Africa's most populous nation. Switzerland's highest court backtracks on a controversial rape ruling. A year ago, it had referred to a sexual assault case as, and I'm quoting, a rape of short duration. This had triggered widespread outrage in the country. The court now says the duration of the assault cannot be a factor in sentencing. And in India, heavy rains lash parts of Tamil Nadu. Chennai faces severe waterlogging and transport disruptions. Schools and colleges shut. As the state government declares a public holiday, the Med Department predicts more showers over the next two days. Justin Trudeau is under pressure. Two days ago, he went after Indian diplomats, accusing them of crimes like extortion and murder without proof. This triggered a full-blown diplomatic standoff. India downgraded its relationship with Canada. It expelled Canadian diplomats and recalled six Indian diplomats, including India's High Commissioner to Canada. More importantly, India rejected all the charges leveled by Canada. So Trudeau started a diplomatic knife fight but it's not going the way he'd planned. He's not being able to make the charges stick. He's leaning on his Western friends for support, the likes of the United States and the UK, all of whom have weighed in on the matter, saying more or less the same thing. Basically, the West is advising India to work with the Canadians to investigate the allegations made by Ottawa. We wanted to see the government of India cooperate with Canada in its investigation. Obviously, they have not chosen that path. That was the U.S. State Department. The U.K. said pretty much the same thing, that India should cooperate with, and I'm quoting, Canada's legal process. London says 
that that's the right next step. So this is basically Trudeau's new game plan. Seek support from his friends, get a few statements issued, and build pressure on India. He has given this task to his foreign minister. Her name is Melanie Jolie. She's reaching out to the five eyes. It's basically a group of intelligence for intelligence sharing, the five eyes. As the name suggests, the five eyes alliance has five members. Canada is one of them. The others are Australia, New Zealand, the US, and the UK. Now, the Canadian minister has sought their help. She wants to rally support for Canada. And the Five Eyes have stepped up, but so far their support is lukewarm. Canada wanted a sweeping condemnation of India. They even made calls for economic sanctions. Yesterday, Foreign Minister Jolie had dropped a hint. She said, and I'm quoting, everything is on the table. But Trudeau's friends in the Five Eyes appear hesitant. They seem unwilling to risk their ties with India for Trudeau's political gains. This includes Canada's most important ally, the United States. Despite this row and the divisions between New Delhi and Ottawa, the U.S. has called India a strong partner. Yeah. India continues to be an incredibly strong partner of the United States. We work with them uh, on a number of matters, including uh, our shared vision for a free, open, prosperous Indo-Pacific. Um, and when we have concerns, we have the relation, kind of relationship where we can take those concerns to them and have very frank, candid conversations about those concerns. This is from the same State Department briefing. Washington is sending some important messages here. First of all, there is no change in the India-US relationship. Washington is not reassessing ties with New Delhi. They will continue to work together on bilateral and multilateral issues. That's point number one. Second, when there is a problem, when differences do arise, both India and the US are willing to sit across the table, have an honest and open dialogue, and find solutions together. That is essentially the signal from, from America, and it's, it's the sign of a mature relationship. And the other five I members are taking the same line. Yesterday, Trudeau himself called London. He spoke with Keir Starmer, the Prime Minister of the UK. Trudeau briefed Starmer about the allegations against India. And what was Starmer's response? His office released a statement. It's on your screen right now. Look carefully. There is no mention of India or the statements made by Trudeau in public. It simply says both leaders discussed recent developments regarding allegations under investigation in Canada. It's a vague statement. Australia has taken a similar approach. Canberra's statement makes no mention of India. The Australian Prime Minister was asked about, about this. The Prime Minister is Anthony Albanese, and he gave a generic response. Albanese did not address the issue directly. He was asked, if he had spoken to Trudeau and listened to the response, he said, I speak with the Prime Minister of Canada all the time. So no commitment of support, no criticism of India. Finally, we have New Zealand. Its Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters spoke on the matter. He said Canada has briefed the New Zealand government. Once again, there was no reference to India. In fact, Peters added a caveat. He said, if Canada's charges are proven, then it would be a matter of concern. So all of the Five Eyes members, except Canada, of course, are treading with caution. Trudeau may have hoped for more, to get his allies to condemn India. Instead, he ended up highlighting his own shortcomings, limitations, and immaturity. Trudeau's allegations have united India, whether it's political parties or social media or commentators. But over in Canada, it's quite the opposite. Justin Trudeau is facing a lot of flack. Some Canadian media outlets are questioning his strategy. Even his own party men want him to quit. Look at the National Post. It's an English newspaper based in Toronto. Listen to what their op-ed says. I'm quoting. Trudeau has allowed diaspora politics to unduly influence foreign policy pledging that Sikh values are Canadian values at events and failing to crack down on suspected Khalistani extremists living in Canada. Quite an indictment there. It's exactly what the government of India has been saying. Vote bank politics and shielding extremists. And it's not just one report. Here's another Canadian journalist. He says Trudeau has failed to give evidence that he's stuck in the trust me bro phase. Trust me, bro phase, it's a new social media term. People use it when someone makes outlandish claims, and that too baseless ones. Now, Trudeau may not have any evidence, but there is evidence against him. And you wouldn't believe the source. Gurpatwan Singh Pannu, the head of Sikhs for Justice, a banned Khalistani terrorist group. Pannu went on Canadian television 
and he made a damning revelation. He said he's been talking to Trudeau's office for nearly three years. Listen to this. Six for Justice have been communicating with the Prime Minister's office uh, for the last two to three years, uh, detailing all the spy network. How about that? Pannu just admitted a direct link between himself and Trudeau, between a banned terrorist group and the Prime Minister of Canada. Is this not supporting Khalistani separatism? Or is this also a freedom of expression issue? And speaking of Trudeau's Khalistani friends, Jagmeet Singh is also facing heat. He leads Canada's new Democratic Party. On Tuesday, he held a press conference. He called for sanctions on Indian diplomats, only to be laughed off by reporters. Take a look at this. We all need to be unified as Canadian leaders. All of us have to be united in denouncing Modi and making sure we protect Canadians and put their safety first and foremost. Are you Thank you. Saying whether or not you have personal what do you mean to be saying that you're leaving open that assumption? This is the last question. Gonna let her, uh, yeah. He's gone. Yeah. He's, He's gone. gone. Yeah. <laughs> also, that's still not how it works. Yeah. yeah. We can't just go online. This timing may look pretty bad because Trudeau is already facing a party rebellion. He leads the Liberal Party. They have lost key by elections in Canada, so some party leaders want a change in leadership. Reports say 20 members of parliament are on board. They've signed a letter asking Justin Trudeau to, set, to step aside to get a new blood. And now the Canadian media is on his case. So it may look like bad timing, but perhaps that is the idea. Just think about it. What's the more interesting story? Liberal backbenchers trying to oust Trudeau or interna an international diplomatic scandal? The answer is obvious. Trudeau has managed to shift the focus from himself to India. We saw that during his press conference. Reporters asked him about the party rebellion. Look at how he shut them down. There will be time to talk about uh, internal party uh, intrigue uh, at another moment. But right now, this government, and indeed all parliamentarians, should be focused on standing up for Canada's sovereignty, standing against interference, and looking to be there to support Canadians in this difficult moment. In the short run, this may work. Perhaps the headlines will shift, but one fight with India will not fix Justin Trudeau's problems. Just look at the opinion polls. The opposition Conservative Party is at 42%. Trudeau's Liberals are at 23%. Now, opinion polls can go wrong, but a 20% difference rarely does which is why the opposition is being cautious. They are not lining up behind Trudeau. They know what the strategy is to portray Justin Trudeau as some sort of savior, as the defender of Canadian citizens. And the opposition is not falling for that trap, especially conservative leader Pierre Polyev. He's pretty active on social media, but on this issue, he did not issue a statement directly. Instead, he posted a statement via his party. Plus, no press conferences either, no calls for sanctions or punitive actions. So Trudeau's plan appears to be backfiring. If anything, Canadians are learning more about Khalistani gangs, about what they stand for, what their past is, and what their goal is. It's clearly not what Justin Trudeau expected. He thought Canadians would close ranks behind him. Instead, they're asking questions like, where is your evidence? What will be the cost of your standoff with India? It's very different to the situation here because while India is protecting its sovereignty and territorial integrity, Trudeau is fighting for his political survival. For India, this is not new. We've always been victims of terrorism. We've flagged it multiple times. We've pointed fingers at the puppet masters, but the West has always ignored it. I have some examples for you, none bigger than Pakistan, of course. After the 9-11 attack, America launched the war on terror. They roped in Pakistan to fight alongside them. Back then, India warned Washington. Foreign Minister Jaswant Singh said, the problem cannot be the solution. 
meaning Pakistan is the source of terrorism, therefore it cannot be the solution. That's what India told the Americans. The Americans, of course, ignored India's warnings. They gave Pakistan tons of military support. A decade later, the U.S. managed to kill 9-11 mastermind Osama bin Laden. Where? Inside that same Pakistan. Even today, it's the same situation. India has been calling out Pakistan's terror campaigns, but the West doesn't care. Donald Trump briefly cut off the military aid, but Joe Biden resumed it. Another example is Afghanistan. In 2010, Kabul hosted a peace conference. The Indian foreign minister attended it. Listen to his warning back then. This is from 2010. The international community must learn lessons from past experiences at negotiating with fundamentalist and extremist organizations. Adequate capacity of the Afghan security forces is necessary for protecting Afghanistan's sovereignty. Gains of the last nine years stand to be squandered if this aspect does not receive the attention that it deserves. This was India's warning in 2010. And what did the West do? Exactly the opposite. First, they negotiated with the Taliban, then they left in a hurry, which means Afghan security forces were not prepared. As a result, India's prediction came true. The gains of two decades were squandered almost overnight. A third example is Khalistan. By the 1980s, India had started warning Western countries. In 1982, New Delhi took up the issue with Canada specifically. Trudeau's father, Pierre Trudeau, was prime minister then. He decided to ignore the issue. In fact, India had also asked Canada to extradite a Khalistani suspect, a man named Talvinder Singh Parmar. Again, Canada rejected it. The same man went on to mastermind the Kanishk bombing. He blew up an Air India flight in 1985. 329 people were killed in that attack. More than 260 of them were Canadians. Do you see the trend here? India keeps warning the West about terror threats. The West keeps ignoring them. And finally, India has proven right. What explains this Western ignorance? Well, the Cold War may have played a role. India was not aligned with the West during that time. It was much closer to the Soviet Union. Maybe that explains the Western interference, Western indifference rather, to India's concerns. It explains, but not justifies. Because it wasn't just ignoring concerns. Sometimes the West has also worked against India's interests. The best example is the Taliban in Afghanistan. The US funded and armed these radicalized fighters. And India paid the price for it. The Taliban helped Pakistani terrorists launch attacks in Kashmir. Nearly 40% of the deaths, 4-0, 40% of the deaths happened in that period from 1996 to 2001 when the Taliban ruled Kabul. Same in Sri Lanka. The Tamil Tiger groups, the Tamil terror groups, got most of their funding from the West, from countries like Switzerland and the UK. These countries were home to a large Tamil diaspora. That's where the funding came from. Again, who paid the price for it? Ordinary Sri Lankans, yes, but India was also dragged into the conflict. So my point is quite simple. Do not dismiss India's terror concerns. Do not ignore the red flags, because this is not a case of the boy crying wolf. India has always been measured and realistic in its demand. Even with Canada, New Delhi did try its best. It was only on Monday that the language and the tone sharpened. So ignore India's concerns at your own peril. So India and Canada are on a war path. Will trade be caught in the crossfire? Ottawa was asked this question and it said that it will be business as usual, that economic relations will not be affected. But in this current environment, is that even possible? How big is the India-Canada bilateral trade? Which items are likely to be affected? Could this escalate into a trade war? And which economy will suffer more in the event of a trade war? Our next report tells you. India-Canada relations are at an all-time low. There have been harsh statements. Diplomats have been expelled. There's no sign of resolution. So what's next? Will all of this impact more than just political ties? Will it impact bilateral trade? Canada says that it's unlikely. Its international trade minister is trying to reassure Canadian businesses, especially those with ties to India. Mary Ng issued a statement talking about the uncertainty. She said the government will continue to support economic ties between the two countries.
so Canada says trade won't be affected. It will be business as usual. But if things do get bad, what's on the line? To understand that, let's look at India and Canada's trade relationship. The bilateral trade is worth around $8 billion. That's less than 1% of India's total global trade. Since 2017, India has increased exports to Canada. The trade deficit was $2 billion then, and now it's down to $0.7 billion. What about foreign investment? In 20 years, Canada has invested $3.6 billion in India. That's around 0.5% of India's total FDI. Over 600 Canadian companies and organizations have a presence in India. So trade isn't as significant. But there are a few crucial items. First on the list is pulses. India buys a lot of lentils from Canada. In fact, 25% of India's pulse import is just from Canada. This year, it was worth around $930 million. So pulses are important. After all, they are a staple here in India. But it's not just New Delhi that will be hurt if there's a trade war. Canada will feel the pinch too. Its farmers produce 1.5 million tonnes of lentils and India buys a major bulk of that. Another important item on the list is potash. It's a very important fertiliser. In 2022, India signed a deal with Canada to import potash. Under this, New Delhi would buy 1.5 million tonnes of potash. And it's crucial because India imports a total of 4 million tonnes of potash every year. So Canada provides a significant chunk of that. This was a three-year agreement. It hasn't been affected by this diplomatic crisis. Other imports include asbestos, copper, minerals and industrial chemicals. So that's the imports. And what does India export to Canada? Well, it's a mix of items. These are the top five. Pharma products, organic chemicals, iron and steel, gems and jewellery and electricals. In 2022, both India and Canada even explored the idea of a free trade agreement. Talks began in the month of March. They continued until July 2023. There were as many as nine rounds of talks. Things were looking good until the Canadian Prime Minister accused India. India has since called off those talks. It's unlikely to resume them anytime soon. In the current situation, Canada has more to lose if things go south. Now, Ottawa says trade won't be affected, but political standoffs inevitably affect trade ties. There may be no official bans or restrictions, but traders remain wary. Businesses want to steer away from trouble and seek safer options. In the case of India and Canada, things will be no different. Let us use this opportunity to exchange ideas. Now let's turn our attention to Pakistan. The country just finished hosting the SCO Summit. SCO stands for Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's a Russia and China-led bloc with 10 member countries from Asia. Pakistan is one of them and it was chosen to host this year's summit. By the looks of it, they pulled it off. No explosions, no terror attacks, no murder sprees of any kind. So Islamabad does deserve some credit for managing the bare basics. It was no mean feat. Pakistan deployed 12,000 security personnel to maintain law and order. They also shut down all shops and businesses. It was inconvenient for the locals, but the Pakistani establishment accomplished its main goal, pulling off an incident-free SCO summit. It must have been a relief for the attendees, which included some high-profile figures. You had the guest of honor, China's Premier Li Chiang. Pakistan was especially keen on showing him a good time. We'll get to the reason in a moment. Also in attendance was Russia's Prime Minister, Michal Mishustin, Mikhail Mishustin. And from Central Asia, you had the Prime Ministers of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan.
and the Prime Ministers of Belarus and Mongolia were also present. As I said, quite the high-profile guest list. India's Prime Minister was also invited, but Prime Minister Modi chose not to attend. Instead, he sent External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar. Who arrived in Rawalpindi yesterday. It was the first visit by an Indian minister since 2015. He attended the SCO banquet last, last night where he met Pakistan's Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif. This morning, Jay Shankar began his day with a morning walk at the High Commission campus in Islamabad. India has a diplomatic mission in Pakistan's capital, and Jay Shankar interacted with his colleagues there. He even planted a tree on the campus as part of the Indian government's tree plantation campaign. After that, he went to the main SCO venue, he took part in the photo op, stood for the family photo, got the pleasantries out of the way and then got down to business, the main SCO summit. Now, before I get into the details, here are some things that you should know. The SCO began as a regional grouping to promote trade and security. Its main goal is, and I'm quoting, strengthening mutual trust and friendship and good neighborliness. I'm not joking. It's in the SCO charter. The bloc initially comprised Russia, China and some Central Asian nations. It gradually expanded to include India and Pakistan in 2017. Then Iran came in 2023 and Belarus joined this year. Right now, the SEO claims to represent 40% of the world's population and about 30% of the world's GDP. China is one of the founding members. It wants to bolster the grouping further, turn it into an anti-Western bloc. Most of the other members are just keen on development. They want to use the SCO to set up infrastructure and trade, like Pakistan. Like the Belt and Road Initiative of uh, President Xi Jinping, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is uh, in its second phase, and the International North-South Transport Corridor should be expanded, focusing on developing road, rail, and digital infrastructure. Now, Pakistan calling for expanding infrastructure sounds like a good idea until you think about the money. Who exactly will pay for all of that? Well, you remember how I called the Chinese Premier the guest of honor. This is the reason. Lee Chiang was given the royal treatment. He met the who's who of Pakistan's establishment. He even ended up inaugurating an airport. And then during the summit, Shehbaz Sharif said, and I'm quoting, Pakistan supports the establishment of an SCO alternative development funding mechanism, which could provide the impetus needed for the revival of stalled development projects. Basically, Pakistan just asked for a new loan, or rather a new bank to regularly take loans from. Let's see how China responds to that. And Shehbaz Sharif did not stop there. He had another zinger lined up. The international community must step forward with urgent humanitarian support while calling upon the Afghan interim government to embrace political inclusivity, thereby ensuring Afghan soil is not misused for terrorism against its neighbors. Yes, you heard that right. Shehbaz Sharif has a problem with terrorism, with terror being used against neighbors. Perhaps he should head on to, to nearby Rawalpindi and convey this to Pakistan's military establishment. It's a classic case of the pot calling the kettle black. Islamabad is fine with terrorism when it is used against India, but terror from Afghanistan is an urgent matter for the SCO. Talk about hypocrisy. Now remember, Jay Shankar was at this meeting. He had to sit through this whole charade. But then he delivered his address and it summarized India's point of view. Jay Shankar said, and I'm quoting, if trust is lacking or cooperation inadequate, if friendship has fallen short and good neighborliness is missing somewhere, there are surely reasons to introspect and causes to address. If activities across borders are characterized by terrorism, extremism, and separatism, they are hardly likely to encourage trade, energy flows, connectivity, and people-to-people -people exchanges in parallel. The message was quite simple. The speeches at the SCO mean very little, honestly. If the member states don't adhere to the group's charter, if they don't behave like good neighbors, India's neighbors are China and Pakistan. One tries to capture territory, the other tries and keeps sending terrorists. Until these transgressions stop, 
India won't be very enthusiastic about the SCO. Twelve bomb threats in 72 hours. I repeat that for you. Over the past 72 hours, 12 Indian flights have received bomb threats, including Air India, Indigo, Spicejet and Akasa Air. The threats were posted on social media. They caused widespread panic, long delays and diversions. But later, all the bomb threats were found to be hoaxes. So who was behind this and why? Here's a report. Over the past 72 hours, at least 12 Indian flights have received bomb threats. The threats were posted on social media with flight numbers and flight names. Who were the victims? Air India, Indigo, Spicejet and Akasa Air Flights. The threats came in all shapes and sizes, from 6 kilos of RDX on a flight to time bombs about to detonate to terrorists on board. Later, all the threats were found to be hoaxes, but the damage was already done. The threats sparked widespread panic for Indian Airlines, for hundreds of people on the flights, for governments both in India and globally. They led to long delays and diversions. On Monday, after the threats were posted, three international flights that took off from Mumbai were diverted or delayed. But the trouble was far from over. On Tuesday, seven flights were delayed. An Air India plane from Delhi to Chicago had to land at a Canadian airport. Later, another Air India flight, this time from Madurai to Singapore, received a bomb threat. So Singapore scrambled its fighter jets to escort the plane away from populated areas. And today, two more threats were made to an Indigo flight from Mumbai to Delhi and an Akasa air flight from Delhi to Bengaluru. While people everywhere are breathing a sigh of relief knowing that the threats were fake, the question remains, who caused this pandemonium? There are no clear answers yet. Authorities are investigating the threats. They are trying to identify the people behind them and considering legal action, including placing those responsible on a no-fly list. That is, once they've zeroed in on the suspects. So far, the list includes only one individual, a teenager. He's been detained in connection with the threats made on Monday. The accused is a 17-year-old boy, a class 11 student from the state of Chhattisgarh, he allegedly posted the threat messages on the social media platform X in an attempt to implicate a 31-year-old man with whom the boy has a history of disputes. This includes a financial issue involving 3 lakh rupees and a sexual assault case. So according to the initial investigation, this could have been the motive behind the hoax messages posted to target the man. So currently, the 17-year-old and his father are under investigation. But the main question is, what triggered the sudden surge of threats this week? And can only one person be behind this? While the probe is underway, security at airports has been increased. So has security on flights, with additional sky marshals. After all, when airlines receive bomb threats, they set in motion a range of steps from the involvement of bomb disposal squads, sniffer dogs, ambulances, police and international agencies. With international flights being targeted, other countries have also gotten involved, including Singapore and Canada, who are pursuing their own investigations into the case. So while the threats may have been fake, they have led to thousands of dollars in damages to both airlines and security agencies through delays and detours. So these bomb threat hoaxes will be investigated with all seriousness to ensure that our skies remain safe. Our next story is about the war in West Asia. Israel has been at war for more than a year now. It started with the October 7th Hamas attack and the subsequent war on Gaza. The war escalated last month. It expanded into Lebanon. With Israel now fighting Hezbollah in Lebanon, Israel bombed Beirut again today, that's Lebanon's capital. Israel targeted the suburbs in southern Beirut and it leveled multiple buildings in the area. Israel also launched an airstrike on Nabatieh, 
a major town in southern Lebanon. The Israeli strike hit Nabate's municipal headquarters. At least six people were killed, including the town's mayor. Meanwhile, Hezbollah launched a barrage of rockets at northern Israel. They fired around 30 rockets. Most were intercepted, but at least one hit the ground and injured four people. Now, while Israel is busy fighting in Lebanon, it hasn't forgotten about Gaza. It is conducting an operation in northern Gaza as well, but a problem has cropped up. Israel is starting to face pushback from its chief ally, the United States. On Sunday, the U.S. sent Israel a letter threatening to cut military aid. Yes, you heard that right. Israel's biggest backer has threatened to stop sending weapons unless Israel eases the pressure on Gaza. Washington's chief concern is aid flowing into Gaza. As you know, Gaza is under siege. Israel control, controls almost all routes in and out of Gaza. This means that Israel also controls anything that goes in, including humanitarian aid. Now, Israel has squeezed aid in the past. But in April, they eased the pressure. They started allowing three to 400 trucks of aid to enter the enclave every day. But that number has been falling because of a new customs law that Israel brought in. This law allows Israel to stop relief supplies from entering Gaza. And because of that, the aid flowing in is about half of what it was a few months ago. The U.S. is not happy about this. They want at least 350 trucks of relief supplies to enter Gaza every day. And that is what they demanded in the letter. Washington has issued an ultimatum. If the aid does not flow within 30 days, the U.S. might cut military aid to Israel. And this may not be a bluff. The U.S. can do it. It's written into their law. Any country receiving American weapons during a war has an obligation. It must not hinder the U.S. from delivering aid. That's what the law says. So technically, Israel is violating American law by stopping aid shipments. And that means that the U.S. is legally required to stop sending them weapons. All of this was mentioned in Sunday's letter, which was signed by the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and the U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. So Israel is taking it seriously. Its military released this video today, the Israeli military, purportedly showing aid trucks entering Gaza. Again, this was released by the Israeli military, so it seems that the U.S. threat worked. But why do you think that is? After all, Israel has happily ignored the U.S. in the past. U.S. President Joe Biden drew multiple red lines. He told Netanyahu to not invade Rafa, to not escalate the war, to not invade Lebanon. Netanyahu was playing hopscotch with Biden's red lines. Why then is Israel suddenly paying heed to an American threat? Well, because it's not just America anymore. All of Israel's Western allies are upset with Netanyahu, and they're all contemplating punitive action. Let's start with France. Netanyahu is in a war of words with the French president, Emmanuel Macron. Macron had called for the end of weapon shipments to Israel last week. This was over Israel's actions in Lebanon. Obviously, Netanyahu was not amused. He called Macron's statement a disgrace. The spat has now escalated. Yesterday, Macron held a meeting with his ministers. It was a closed-door meeting, but one of the attendees leaked. Macron's statement. He apparently said that Netanyahu should not ignore decisions from the United Nations. He added, and I quote, Mr. Netanyahu must not forget that his country was created by a UN decision. This is a reference to a UN General Assembly vote in 1947, which ended the British mandate of Palestine and created the modern state of Israel. Netanyahu was furious when he heard about Macron's barb. He responded by saying, and I'm quoting again, a reminder to the president of France. It was not the UN resolution that established the state of Israel, but rather the victory achieved in the war of independence with the blood of heroic fighters, many of whom were Holocaust survivors, including from the Vichy regime in France. That's a sharp rebuke and an insult. Netanyahu reminded Macron that some French people bent the knee to the Nazis and helped Hitler kill Jewish people. Netanyahu is not conceding to Macron. But how long can he keep defying the West? Today, the UK decided to pile on the pressure. And Israel must take all possible steps to avoid civilian casualties, to allow aid into Gaza in much greater volume, and provide the UN and humanitarian partners the ability to operate uh, effectively. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, along with France, the UK will convene an urgent meeting of the UN Security Council to address this. 
Britain seems to be following America's lead and they're backing France to boot. It seems like a coordinated effort. The West is squeezing Israel together. They want Netanyahu to increase aid to Gaza and back away from Lebanon. Netanyahu's options are limited. He needs Western weapons to continue the war. That explains the fresh aid to Gaza. But will he listen to the West when it comes to Lebanon and Hezbollah? Judging by today's airstrikes, that's highly unlikely. Money and elections, they go hand in hand, and it's the case everywhere in the world, including in the U.S. The campaigning is in the last stretch, and looks like Donald Trump has gotten some last-minute cash boost. It came from his BFF, Elon Musk, and two other billionaires. They've poured $220 million into the Trump campaign in the last three months. But will that be enough to match Kamala Harris? Since July, her campaign has raised more than a billion dollars, and they're still raising funds. The more important question, perhaps, is will money give Harris an edge in swing states? And can Trump's billionaire friends help him bridge the gap? Our next report explores. Elections are an expensive affair. You need money for basically everything. In the U.S., there are restrictions on how much money a candidate can receive. You can't contribute millions directly. But there's a way around it. PACs or political action committees. You can put money in a PAC and in turn use that money to influence an election. On Tuesday, America PAC submitted its filings. It's a pro-Trump super PAC that was formed this summer. In the last three months, it has gotten $75 million in donations. And all of this money came from one person, Elon Musk. Take over, Elon, yes, take over. He donated $15 million in July, $30 million in August, and another $30 million in September. In fact, he is the PAC's only donor. Well, it helps having the world's richest person in your corner. But Musk isn't alone. Two other billionaires have funneled millions to support the Trump campaign. They are businesswoman Miriam Adelson and packaging magnate Richard Uline. Together, Musk, Adelson and Uline have donated $220 million in just three months. So billionaires are backing Trump in this last stretch. That's good news for the Republican presidential nominee. After all, he's up against a better-funded rival. I'm talking about Democratic presidential nominee Kamala Harris. Her campaign has raised $1 billion since July. No presidential candidate has ever raised so much money so fast. Where did that money come from? Well, a mix of sources. Yes, there have been big money donors, PACs and also ordinary voters. In fact, her fundraising committee raised $633 million in the third quarter of 2024. The Trump campaign got around $160 million during the same time. So basically, Harris raised four times that amount. But her campaign doesn't want to get complacent. They fear the cash may dry up in the last stretch. So fundraising events continue as usual. The Harris campaign believes it's essential for the last few weeks. So what is this money being used for? Well, for everything from door-to-door -door campaigning to an advertising blitz. Take Elon Musk's Super PAC, for example. It launched a massive campaign in the swing states. These are the states that will decide who gets the White House, and the most crucial among them is Pennsylvania. So the America PAC is on the ground there. It spent $57 million on canvassing and field operations. Meanwhile, the Harris campaign has pre-booked $370 million worth of ads. This is both on television and online. They have also spent $11 million on Facebook and Instagram ads, mostly targeting the seven swing states. The campaign even invested thousands of dollars on bracelets, these Harris Waltz friendship bracelets. If the elections were determined by just spending, we all know who would win. But that's not how it works. The Harris campaign may be swimming in cash and it gives them an edge. But money alone cannot win the U.S. presidential elections.
The elections have put the spotlight on American media. Normally, this is a good thing. Elections bring more viewership. Viewership brings more money and everybody goes home happy. But maybe not this time because Americans do not trust their media anymore. Look at the findings of a new Gallup poll. Only 31% Americans trust their media outlets. We're talking about mass media here, your television, newspapers, radio, all of it combined together. Only 31% Americans trust this media. And this number has been falling consistently. In 1972, 68% Americans trusted the media. By 1976, it actually increased to 72%. But then, since then, it's been a steep fall. What's more, Americans trust government institutions more than the media, which is quite unusual for the U.S. because this is a country where people think their government faked the moon landing. Yet 55% people trust their local government and 43% trust the federal government. So trust issues are not the problem. The institution is. Let's look at other places. Like in India, 41% people trust the media. The trust is higher for state-owned news agencies, interestingly. For example, 65% Indians trust the All India Radio. Even regional newspapers are quite trusted by 61% Indians, according to one survey. And what about commercial platforms? They're a lot lower than public ones, not as low as in the United States. Then you have Britain, where media trust has rebounded after major lows. It was 51% in 2015. It plunged to 28% during the Wuhan virus pandemic, but since then, it has slowly recovered to 33% last year and 36% this year. In Europe, the trend is similar to India. Nearly 48% people trust state broadcasters. Only 29% trust private TV stations. We also have numbers from China and Russia where a whopping 100% trust the media. I am kidding, of course. It's likely to be in the high 99% to make it believable. But jokes aside, what is the message here? Why is media trust below 50% in major markets? Obviously, fake news is a problem. Fact-checking is not as rigorous as it used to be. Another problem is bias, and it's quite evident in the U.S. Most conservatives talk about the media's liberal bias. Donald Trump weaponized it in 2016. He's doing it again this time. A third issue is the rise of social media. People don't use traditional outlets as much anymore. So why would they trust something they don't even use? Just consider India. Nearly half of all Indians get their news online from YouTube or WhatsApp or X. Nearly half. These platforms are doing two things. Some of them are not prioritizing news at all. They're focusing on other topics like travel or cooking. Those who still prioritize news do not push publishers. They're pushing content creators. People who, who can make funky, addictive content. One example of that is X. Elon Musk is a vocal critic of mainstream media, so he wants the so-called citizen journalists to take over. He's also paying them for their content. The question is, what can be done about this? How can we restore the trust? We say it all boils down to one thing, and that is money. Most people do not pay for news. They'll pay for music or streaming content, but they will not pay for news. Only 17% people in rich countries pay for news. One seven, 17. 17% in India, it is just 5%. Plus, advertising money is moving away. Nowadays, brands like to advertise on social media. As a result, traditional media houses are struggling. Nearly 3,000 American newspapers have shut down since 2005. Layoffs are quite common. In India, there was a 15% rise in firings this year. So what do media firms do? What do media platforms do? They look for funding elsewhere. Enter big corporates and entities with vested interests. They come with their own political calculations. Some see the media only as a business, not as a civic institution. Others see it as a tool to wield influence or push their agenda. And often it is the content that suffers. Do you think legacy outlets cannot make addictive content or do in-depth ground reports? or weave together trending stories. Of course they can, but you need money. You need independence to do it. It's easy to dismiss the media as fake or biased. It's harder to walk the talk and pay for the news. Anti-hustle. Have you heard of this term? Apparently it is becoming quite popular. It, use, it is used to describe certain jobs where you can work when you like, from where you like, and mostly how you like. So you can do your bit 
and call it a day. This is an anti-hustle work life, and it has become the war cry of younger workers, the Gen Z, those born between 1997 and 2012. That's the Gen Z. With its oldest members turning 27 years old, this generation makes up a significant chunk of the workforce. But the so-called anti-hustle mode has also earned them quite the reputation. No points for guessing. It's not a good one. Gen Z is widely considered an employer's nightmare. And survey after survey shows this. A new one is out. It says that one in six companies do not want to hire Gen Z. They say Gen Z is entitled, easily offended, unable to handle feedback, lacking in motivation, professionalism, strong work ethic and communication skills. That's quite the list. It makes you think, what doesn't Gen Z lack? Apparently, the ability to make things worse. Over the past few years, the young haven't helped their case by making up these work trends. Quiet quitting, lazy jobs, mouse jiggling where you only pretend to work by moving your computer mouse, that's mouse jiggling apparently, or conscious unbossing, meaning consciously choosing not to be a boss or a manager. 69% Gen Z say they do not want to be middle managers because it's too high stress and low reward. I don't want to question the obvious lack of logic here. Maybe there is a secret sauce to jumping from intern to CEO. Maybe TikTok holds the answers. Who knows? But the fact remains, the young are not seen as great employees. Nearly half of the hiring managers find Gen Z the most challenging generation to work with. This is not to say that all of Gen Z is a personality hire or someone who is hired for their so-called vibes. That's, that's a personality hire, apparently. Instead of their skills, they're hired for their vibes. There are a lot of factors at play here. For starters, the current workforce is not ready for Gen Z. Let me give you some examples. Most young workers want time flexibility. A quarter of them say that their productivity peaks at night. So they want to work at night. But in this world of nine to five, that's not going to fly. Take for instance, job hopping. Young workers are willing to change their careers three times. Careers, not jobs. Three times in their lifetime. But for traditional employers, this is a red flag. Plus, there is generational friction. Every generation thinks that the young are worse than them. And this is only normal. Research proves this, and so do headlines. Until a decade ago, do you know what they were saying about millennials? They're bad employees, they lack work ethic, they're lazy, they're entitled. It's a circle of life and everything. But intellectualizing aside, my point is quite simple. Companies may not want to hire Gen Z, but they will have to sooner or later because they are the future of work. In fact, by next year, Gen Z will form a quarter of the global workforce. So unless the older generation is planning a coup, they will have to focus on solutions like better training or adaptability. Gen Z has a lot of work to do as well. Historically speaking, this is the most privileged generation. They grew up with the internet, with technology. For them, all kinds of resources are one click away. So about time that they check their privilege. The fact that they can afford to quiet quit or afford to get lazy jobs is because of the workforce that came before them. So insulation, apathy, or unrealistic self-assurance is not going to cut it in the real world. Experiences. Because it is good to be passionate about change, but Rome was not built in a day. So if you have any ambition, no matter which generation you belong to, you will have to do the time. Our joke tonight is the gift that keeps on giving, the U.S. election campaign. Kamala Harris is struggling to get male support, so she, she deployed her running mate. That's Tim Waltz. Now, Waltz served in the U.S. military. He's also a proud gun owner, so he decided to hit the outdoors for a day of hunting because apparently that is what men do. They take guns and shoot something. Just one problem, though. Tim Waltz simply couldn't reload his gun. The full struggle was caught on camera and social media did the rest. On the other side, Donald Trump had a different struggle. He held a rally in Philadelphia. Two of his supporters fainted because of the heat. As a result, there was a delay. So Trump turned the event into a 40-minute dance session, swaying weirdly to a couple of songs. Take a look.
And now it's time for Vantage Shots images that tell the story. The German ambassador to India welcomes his new car in true Indian fashion by smashing a coconut and trying and tying Nimbu Mirchi. In Turkey, a TV news anchor takes cover during a live broadcast as an earthquake strikes the country's east and the NASA spacesuit gets a high fashion upgrade for the Artemis mission. Finally, we are taking you back in history on this day in 1793. Marie Antoinette was beheaded. She was the last queen of France before the French Revolution. Her lavish lifestyle made her a symbol of royal excess. Public resentment against the monarchy sealed her fate. Her death was a significant moment for France, making, marking the fall of the aristocracy. We're leaving you on that note. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Deprem oluyor değerli seyirciler. Deprem. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allah'a emanet olun. First Post decodes the U.S. election, explains how America chooses its president. Your primer on the race to the White House. Everything you need to know about how America votes and its global implications. U.S. election explained every Monday and Thursday only on First Post.